A very warm welcome from my side. Uh, Andreas Seidel is my name. I will be uh, guiding you through this webinar today. Uh, some organizational topics uh, up front. We will be recording this session so you can review it afterwards or share with colleagues um, if you like. Um, if you're having questions during the webinar, please write them in the chat. We will answer them uh, afterwards. Um, yeah, and with this, I would like to start. The topic we want to address today is uh, efficient use of simulation in the development process. Uh, really um, interesting and also an important topic, more and more important topic. Uh, two sentences about myself, uh, Andreas Seidel my name. I have an engineering background, mechanical engineering, and I'm dealing with simulation, simulation processes um, since you know, more than a decade. And I'm at DS, at the systems responsible for the simulation business in our indirect channel here in Eurocentral. The webinar today will be with the following agenda. I'm going to give a, a quick introduction, really short introduction on DASO systems. And we'll then focus on what we're here for today, um, first of all, addressing the, the challenges we're seeing in the development process, especially including simulation efficiently in the development process. Um, after highlighting these challenges, we will proceed to a, a concept, an approach, how we as the systems think simulation can be used efficiently, more efficiently. And we'll wrap it up with a conclusion and a highlight on the next events. As you can imagine, the topic is really, really complex. And today's webinar is basically just a, a starting point to, to highlight uh, what it's all about. And in the upcoming uh, webinars, we will deep dive more uh, into the technical uh, topics. Well, the so systems, who are we? We're a, a software company, a scientific company. Uh, we're having uh, more than 250,000 customers, more than 25 million users worldwide. That includes our different CAD users like SolidWorks and CATIA. That's about data management, um, the Inovia database mainly, and um, of course also our new acquisition like Medidata uh, for, for life sciences. Um, and which is why we're here today, our Simulia portfolio where all our simulation topics regarding FEA, CFD, et cetera, are combined uh, under this brand. So let's start with a really basic question. Why simulation? Why do we want to simulate? Um, the target is to, to analyze the behavior of a system before, ideally before we even manufacture anything. So we want to, to break it down to really as easy as possible model, but as precise as possible model to, to find out how will the system behave. And typically when we're looking at the state of the art, we're coming from a, a CAD design, um, building from that design a model, so a mathematical representation. And based on this model, we're doing uh, virtual experiments. So we're putting different uh, boundaries uh, to this model and, and load cases, etc. And based on this, we can virtually do different experiments. And this way, we can, of course, do many, many more experiments in shorter time compared to, the, to the real life. Um, yet it takes a lot of uh, technology, which is a t topic of software, but also know how to, to really get that um, working with as precise results as we, we want to achieve. The vision of the SOS systems is to provide within the Simulia brand a software portfolio that's covering all physics. That's a multi-physics portfolio from structures and solids, what we're seeing here on the left, going to electromagnetics, fluids, thermal controls. And this not only for, for one, let's say scale, but multi-scale from down to a molecular level, material engineering, 
up to the functional level where we're really in, in the domain of systems engineering, a high level systems modeling. And this vision is I think now more than a decade old. And we filled this vision with tools. And not just any tools, but um, high-end tools. We're looking at our FEA side, like Abacus for structures, Simpic for multi-body simulation, CST Studio Suite for, for electromagnetics. All these are technologically leading tools within their domain. And they're all having a really high robustness, high precision, and a high level of trust um, into the outcome if you're using it right. This brings us to the question, why is there such a demand for simulation on the one hand? On the other hand, why is a company like the Social System investing so heavily into this topic? Um, what I've put here is some business drivers basically everyone is, is facing. Um, these are increasing expectations from the customer and the industry, uh, more and more stringent string and regulatory compliance requirements, especially in life sciences, we're seeing that, but of course also in aerospace and defense or uh, transportation mobility. Extreme time pressures, something I think every engineer and every uh, manager can can, uh, can tell uh, that this is an important topic, but also topics like margin pressure. So we have a customer who's um, producing chassis components for the automotive industry. And at some point, they have to sign a contract with the OEM. And if afterwards, due to some changes or uh, not detailed enough analysis, they have to increase the sheet metal thickness, just one tenth of a millimeter, their margin will drop to zero. The whole project will be a, a non-profit project. Um, and of course, reputation risks. And all these drivers we're seeing can be addressed because the objectives that derive from these business drivers like higher quality products, reduced development cycle time, reduced product costs are all influenced by simulation and especially how we are using simulation. So, this is a, a real life example. Um, one of our customers has been uh, evaluating in, in deep detail. Um, it's about structural components and they've been evaluating the, the topic of cost to market and also time to market. And what we're he seeing here is the, the comparison from prototyping test to simulation for the initial setup. And we're seeing here a, a factor of six that it's cheaper. I'm going to show you another example later on where, where the impact is even more extreme, way more extreme. And we have to keep in mind um, a major part of the effort in simulation is to, to build the initial model, doing variants, uh, investigating different different load cases, etc. That's usually not that time consuming. So the, the more, uh, let's say, requirements we have, we want to check with simulation, the cheaper it's getting in comparison. And the, the same thing accounts for time to market. Uh, here the customer was seeing a, a factor of 10, 10 times faster for the initial model. And when we're then thinking of um, automatic design studies or something, uh, it becomes obvious that in the real life, I would have to manufacture all these different versions. While in the simulation, uh, ideally I just change a parameter and say run. And within minutes, hours, depending on the model uh, complexity, we will see the outcome. What effect will it have? And with this, I want to enter the, the topic uh, challenges in development or challenges of simulation in the development process. Um, because if it's that easy with simulation, um, why are we doing it all the time for everything? When we are looking at a simple representation of the V model, we are starting on the top left from requirements. We are looking at a, at a system design, a pre-development phase. We're coming down to the component design, giving everything to, to the CAD engineer, uh, having it designed in CAD. Uh, is putting a lot of effort in there, uh, putting all the details, uh, radii, etc. And then what we're usually seeing is that instead of doing a, a physical prototype, um, we're passing it over to the, to the uh, simulation department. 
this is causing quite some, some issues. Um, first of all, many of the details the design engineer put in there are not needed for simulation. In fact, the simulation engineer usually has to clean it up, um, reduce the level of detail, and this is causing really long turnaround times. And we're having a, another effect. Uh, if this process, this linkage between design and simulation is not done properly, um, I will refer to a, to a presentation from, from one of our customers later on, um, the, the head of uh, digital uh, prototyping highlighted re really nice. Uh, the design engineer is thinking, yeah, should I use a, a parameter with value X or X plus one? And then he's sending a, an email to the simulation department requesting, could you please evaluate that and just take three days until the simulation engineer has capacity to even, even look at it. So having really long turnaround times that um, need to be addressed because we can get the biggest value out of simulation if you can front load it. The earlier we're simulating with the reasonable amount of detail and, and accuracy, the higher is the value we can get out of it. Because the earlier we're doing it and the faster we can do it, the easier it is to, to do uh, decisions, to make decisions. Is option A better or B? Which way should I go? And to avoid that someone is spending hours and days of working time going in the wrong direction. And now let's take a look at the, the development process on a, on a more, uh, on a bigger level. During a development project, we are always, really always starting from requirements. Whatever we want to develop has clear requirements. These can be functional requirements, can be certification requirements, um, whatever you can think of. And these are driving what we want to do. And in the end, these requirements need to be proven. We have to validate that these requirements are fulfilled. And we also, depending on the industry and what we're doing, we have to certify it. So requirements are driving us. And in the end, there's always validation certification. And in between, we're having many, many different steps because what we're seeing here on the right now um, of course, in, in testing as well as in simulation, it's not one test or one physics we want to investigate. We're having a multitude. And in between, we're having a, a detailed design process, we're having concept design process because not all requirements can directly be put to CAD design, for example, or to uh, electronic design. Um, and all this is, is linked, and it's not like a straightforward process. We all know that we're having iterations. We're going back and forth. Requirements might change. Which requirement is affecting what? And, and there's a, a big, big challenge in this. And I'm seeing this rather regularly when I'm talking to customers um, or uh, engineers in general. Um, we're talking about requirements and the complexity of requirements. Um, what is often overlooked is, yes, I might have only one customer requirement. But when I'm breaking it down to a product level, it might already be two requirements. And now let's dig even a, a level deeper. So we might have half a dozen requirements on half a dozen components. And each of that components has several parameters that will influence the outcome. So the, the complexity is, is just exploding on the requirement side. And another topic that's often overlooked is a topic of, of simulation data and simulation data management, especially as our products are getting more and more complex. So we're having uh, often different design processes like mechanical design, electronic design, software design, et cetera, et cetera. And all that is somehow interlinked because the control will drive my mechanical behavior and my electronic behavior. And therefore I've been thinking of, um, yeah, the, the most simple example I could think of. It's basically, as we'll see pretty soon, a, a tube. And this tube is consisting of two parts that are put in an assembly. 
and I thought what would be simulation scenarios for that, uh, likely ones, like we have a static simulation for an internal pressure, we're having a CFD simulation for a pressure drop, and we're having, although it doesn't really make sense, a plastic parts injection analysis. Doesn't make sense for you, but, but just to, to show the context. And what we're seeing now, I'm gonna jump a bit in the video, the, the relations are just exploding. And now imagine you have a, a CAT assembly, 80 parts, 100 parts, with not three simulations you're doing or, or three load cases you want to check, but um, you're having 20 or 30. Being then able to keep track which set of data did I analyze when, with what, why, um, can become a real mess. And I've seen it pretty often. Um, I was experienced myself as an engineer. Uh, you spend as a CAE engineer three, four days in, in, in meshing your components, setting up the model. And in the end, uh, you, you get the feedback, ah, sorry, I've sent you the wrong CAD data. Yeah, that's not fun. So this is leading us to the, to the major drivers in, in simulation we're seeing. Um, on the Top left, which I didn't address yet so much, is cloud compute or a burst compute. Um, if you're into, into engineering, you know that probably, or, or you've experienced it as well. Um, I did. Um, when you're setting up models, often you're just checking, uh, is the model running at all? You, you don't need much uh, compute power at that moment. And then there comes this uh, point in time where the model is running and you want to investigate like 10, 12 different options and then your compute power is always too short. So an on-demand capacity is, is really uh, important. And especially for the hardware that doesn't scale, uh, it's a topic that's driving many, uh, many CE engineers. The second topic um, is multi-physics, as mentioned before. On the top right, we're having a simulation-driven design. That's the thing I mentioned with front-loading simulation, getting simulation in as early as possible, making even uh, more complex simulations available to uh, designers, to, to CAD engineers who don't have a strong background in, in simulation. And last but not least, simulation process and data management. That's not something new, but what's becoming more and more important in context of requirements. Really having a clear traceability from requirements where I'm specifying what I really want to, to prove to the simulation and getting a direct link. What did I fulfill? What did I not fulfill? Um, I have to change something because my structural um, load case is not fulfilled. If I change that, what else will be affected? And I want to highlight here really a, a great customer presentation from our science in the age of experience event from 2017. It's by Juho Könne from Wärtsile. Um, they have taken this path and he's really highlighting very well our first time right of simulation. Initially, I've been showing that um, uh, the simulation is six times cheaper than the prototype. Imagine you have a diesel engine that's just 20 meters long the factor is becoming incredibly big. You can't do prototyping. You have to be first time right. He's highlighting very well why requirements driven validation. He's highlighting how to solve a simulation bottleneck. And he's having a really nice conclusion on the benefits of that. It's just uh, something I want to, to give you um, to, to review later if you're interested. And with this, I will dive into how to use simulation efficiently or what is our approach to to, to use simulation efficiently. And for that, I want to highlight uh, a topic that's driving many of our customers cur uh, currently, which has to do with the uh, whole um, yeah, multi-energy uh, platform story. We're having electric drives, we're having combustion engines, we're having uh, hybrid systems, and that not only in the automotive industry, but also in industrial equipment. When you're looking at uh, tractors, at uh, excavators, you're having these, uh, this shift to, to electric drives basically everywhere. 
And therefore, um, I'm diving into this efficient multi-energy platform. And this is bringing one major challenge. While for the combustion engine, for example, we've had around 100 years continuously improving, developing. Um, there are engineers who have 40 years of experience in that domain. And suddenly we have a complete shift. We're having a, a new technology. No, electric tires are not new, but the, the uh, application where to use them is completely new. The requirements have shifted uh, extraordinarily. And for the people who are using those electric drives, for them, they are often pretty new. So in, in a really short time, we have to come up with something completely new. And this is not only affecting the uh, drive system, it's affecting the whole uh, dynamics of the car. It's affecting the thermal management. It's, it's affecting the, the whole system. And that's where our efficient multi-energy platform approach is basically kicking in. So what we are doing is uh, we're setting up processes end-to-end -end from requirements to, to validation, um, covering the, the different stages for the, let's say, major drivers we're seeing in that domain. Uh, this is affecting the, the uh, body structure, body strength and durability. It's affecting uh, vehicle aerodynamics. Um, vehicle dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. And where I want to focus a bit on today and where also my colleagues will deep dive in the, in the upcoming uh, webinars is the topic of uh, electric drive engineering. When we're looking at an electric drive, I think it's getting pretty obvious the, the different physics we're having, the different uh, requirements we're having. Um, we're having, of course, the typical uh, topics of strength and durability. We're knowing from structures, um, durability topics. We're having thermal management topics, electromagnetic performance. And what's becoming even more and more important uh, is the whole topic of noise and vibration. But in the past, for example, in the car, you had a diesel humming in the front, so you wouldn't hear a lot of effects. Now you hear them. The electric drive is much more silent, so you will hear um, anything that's coming from the from the gearbox, um, and it's also affecting the passenger comfort when it comes to uh, HVAC systems and the, the front registers. If you're having acoustics effects there from the air acoustics, so all this is affected, and this is also leading many uh, companies. To, to the challenge that suddenly they don't have to cover one physics domain anymore. For example, if you're thinking of interior design for cars, um, there's been a lot of uh, plastics parts, structural parts. Um, you hardly find anything where there's not electronics inside. So the complexity is exploding. And one way to, to address these challenges is of course, um, taking a look at the, the licensing behind. So at the CAE software level, we are seeing it pretty often that you're having uh, licenses for the solver and you're having licenses for the graphical user interface and these are separated by domain. So you have tool A, you have a solver license, you have a graphical user inter uh, interface license and, and for tool B, C, etc., the same. This is bringing several challenges because, um, for example, for fluids, you need a rather big license, you need a lot of compute power. and if you're not using them for some time, you're basically burning money. And that would be a waste of potential if uh, the discipline has idling licenses, if you couldn't use them for something else. It's bringing you a high initial investment when exploring new physics, because you would have really do a new investment. And also, if you're having topics that you want to address like twice or three or four times a year, or not on a regular basis, it's really critical to get a reasonable value to invest ratio if you would have to get a tool for just a, an occasional use. And getting external suppliers to do that, services or et cetera, is always an overhead, longer turnaround times, et cetera, et cetera. And also in the, in the context of these um, processes that we've been looking at uh, before, um, we 
it just doesn't make sense to have everything, uh, let's say, decoupled. And therefore, we've introduced a new licensing type where all solvers that we are offering are unified into one license model. And this is really allowing you a high usage of the licenses. If uh, Fluid's licenses would be idle, you can use them for structures or, or the other way around. You're having very low initial investments um, in a strong value to invest ratio. And of course, which is also driving many companies, you can do a software consolidation. In many cases, you don't want to have um, four or five different suppliers for the software sets, different support hotlines, et cetera, et cetera. If you can consolidate that to one trusted partner, uh, it's really valuable as well. And with this, I'm getting to, to the next driver. So it's basically, I'm thinking about the major driver in simulation, the multi-physics topic. The next topic will be around cloud compute or, or burst compute, demand-based compute power. So when we're looking at the typical workload versus capacity for CE software, we're usually seeing that um, companies have a sustained capacity. There's a big HPC somewhere, you have an amount of licenses and you have an amount of compute power. This is uh, pretty fine most of the time. Yet, um, when, when we're looking at the actual need for simulation, there's just a schematic view. We'll have a more detailed one uh, on the next slide. We will have phases where we actually have too much, where we don't need it. Uh, very, very famous times for that is around Christmas, is around uh, summer holiday time. These are typical phases where you don't have uh, such high workloads. And on the other hand, typically September, October, um, and also before Christmas, when people want to go on vacation, uh, you're having really high peaks, high workloads, and um, this can uh, affect your, your turnaround time. Because you can imagine if your uh, demand is up here, your capacity is here, this will flatten out, and you'll have longer turnaround times, which might delay your project. And therefore, we are uh, offering a flexible licensing, a burst licensing, um, on top of the sustained capacity. And by this combination, you can get for, for similar investments uh, way more value out of it. And I think what's really special, um, what I don't see often in the market, we are offering it uh, in, in three types, let's say. These are uh, local on-premise, so if you're having a big cluster um, because you're also using some, some other uh, domains, uh, you can just run it there. We're offering it, of course, on cloud. So if you're going to Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure or, yeah, you know, the typical cloud hosts. And, which is uh, quite a differentiator also, a software as a service. This means you're not going to a cloud host and then have to take care of setting everything up, but you just get it from us. The, the hardware software is installed, everything. You just log in and, and get, get going. I'm gonna highlight that light later on. Now let's first take a look at the uh, workload versus, versus capacity um, uh, comparison. Here I've taken uh, two uses to, to make it really simple. If you're having a, a static sustained capacity, you usually see usage like that. Uh, in the morning, they're getting in the office, they start working a bit, uh, checking the, the models if they're running. Then they put everything in the queue, um, keep preparing some more models. And overnight, it's uh, working sequentially through the different jobs. Yes, it's working sequentially. So if you're having phases where a project is, is red, delayed, um, where you have to uh, investigate six or seven different variants, if this is happening sequentially, um, it's always delaying your project. And the, the engineer, that's what we always have to keep in mind, the engineer is one of the most valuable resources we have. And especially here in, in Europe, for example, it's really hard to get good CAE engineers. The market is, is, is strained, basically. So you have to make your engineers as efficient as possible. And that's exactly where uh, the, the uh, lower section comes in. If I can license that more to the actual need, if I can send my uh, variants I want to do all in parallel, um, then of course, my engineer might be able to do everything uh, 
faster, more efficient, because he doesn't have to wait so much. He, he can go more into an um, iterative approach, doing more versions, doing more variants, or simply doing the same thing faster. And now software as a service versus cloud, what's the difference? Um, I'm in discussion here with, with several of my customers. Um, software as a service is giving you everything readily set up and easy to be accessed. And this means you don't have to take care of the installation. If you're going to a typical cloud host, um, you or your IT has to take care of the installation, uh, the license server. Um, you have the alignment of the cloud host as well, of course. You're on your own responsible for updates. Um, Post-processing is often an issue. Do I access the cloud host via VPN and remote desktop? Do I download all the data? Um, it always sounds so nice, but it's uh, way more complex. Um, and, and the next thing you're offering is a dedicated hardware that's optimized to our simulation solutions. So the performance is really high. And currently we're offering compute power on 4, 8, 18, 36, or 144 cores. Uh, will be increased to, to the upper range till end of the year. But I, I really want to highlight the offering for four and eight cores because many, many jobs especially when there's, uh, these are implicit models, not too big or axisymmetric models, et cetera. They don't need these huge amounts of cores. So really going for, for small amounts of cores is uh, quite an additional value here. And the good thing is uh, with the solution, you just have to log in and you get going. I'm showing you a short video uh, on this. Um, this is, for example, how the interface would look like if you would work locally. And you just want to have for Abacus, for example, um, additional burst compute power to to run some jobs on uh, on the software as a service platform from from us from the so. So you can just drag the simulation manager in there. Um, you also have a tracking of of which jobs you've been doing. Uh, create a new run. Uh, it's called your demo. <laughs> Show how it works. And with this, there's opening a, a new uh, field on the right. And now you can simply with, with drag and drop, uh, put your input file there, it's being uploaded, and then you, you just tick run. And uh, we have several settings like choosing a uh, solver version, um, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really uh, important here, the results can be fully uh, viewed and, and managed. So you don't have to upload or download something, but we're having a, a post processor included here. And um, of course, if you're working uh, the complete software as a services strategy, you would be directly working on the platform, just submitting the job and, and viewing the results without any up or download. It would all be happening on that system. So it's pretty straightforward to use. You select the number of, of course you want to run on um, and just, just hit run. Well, next steps. Um, I've been addressing quite a lot of different topics here. Um, a, a topic of, of multi-physics, a topic of uh, process, how to handle uh, things efficiently, um, simulation data management, um, cloud topics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a really wide field and how we usually engage on this is a four-step process. So the first step would be a value assessment. Just get into discussion. What is your target? Where do you want to go? What is your SE situation? Um, based on that, define what is a possible value for you. This could be a value in just switching uh, the licensing model, could be a value in, in software consolidation, could be a value in a cloud or software as a services strategy, could be a value in, in process topics, um, depends on, on where you want to go. And, and based on this value definition, um, if we find together a value that's, that's reasonable, we would go into a commitment phase from, from both sides and into a value delivery. 
Um, with this, I want to go to the conclusion and next steps already, uh, next events, sorry. Um, I want to highlight again, the major drivers in simulation we're seeing is everything around cloud compute. Companies do not earn money by hosting big HPCs. They don't uh, earn money by setting up software. Um, it's about the, the development process they have. It's about developing uh, what they want to develop. So it's a, a big trend we're seeing. Multi-physics handling all these different requirements that just exploding uh, efficiently on a multi-physics domain, multi-scale domain. Simulation-driven design, getting in simulation as early as possible. Um, and of course, simulation pros and data management in context of requirements. These are the, the four main drivers we're seeing at the moment. And we are offering uh, simulation solutions for, for all these physics, a strong integration capability also for multi-physics, so coupling the different uh, systems. Very scalable in functionality and compute power, especially due to this new licensing model. And this on-premise, uh, on-cloud, software as a service, um, depending on what's your strategy, end-to-end -end development processes, and a clear strategy how to evaluate, how to assess if there's a value, and, and how to deploy it. I think this was quite a lot of input without really diving deeply into the topic. And that's exactly why this is not a single webinar, but a webinar series. And um, therefore, I want to highlight our next events. So in, on April 20th, about one month, we have our next Simulation Tuesday, um, where my colleague Stefan Arfeld is highlighting really an end-to-end -end process for electric drive engineering. Really starting from high-level requirements, digging it down to the functional, to the logical level, to, to, the, to the physical level, we're having a CAD design and simulation closely combined. Uh, so we have a per, or we're having parametric uh, models, basically, um, where we are linking the, the, from the requirements, starting from the requirements, to the CAD data, to the simulation in different physics, linking all that and putting it into, into one uh, efficient process and also highlighting how to handle uh, change or issue management. So if I come up with, um, yeah, some requirement is not fulfilled, I want to tell someone else uh, what would be needed to change. Um, so I really, high command, uh, really recommend to, 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 to dive into that. And after this, let's say, end-to-end -end process, we are diving even deeper into different technical topics. So on May 25th, um, my colleague will be highlighting EMC, electromagnetic compatibility simulation for electric powertrain. Due to the new uh, high voltage structures, we're having completely a complete shift in, in requirements and what's happening there. Um, and this will be then followed up by, by some more topics uh, like uh, drivetrain lubrication, thermal management, due to everly increasing uh, energy densities, thermal management is becoming really, really important um, to lightweight engineering and, and noise and vibration throughout the, the whole year. And another event I want to highlight is our regional user meeting here in Eurocentral. Um, this will be taking place from June 15th to, to 17th. It's free of charge. It's a virtual event. And here we really want to, to have our customers present what they are doing. And of course, there's also gonna be an uh, electric drive uh, uh, session, um, but many more. So fluid sessions, et cetera, et cetera, for, for, for all the uh, industries we're covering. And with this, I'm happy for your attention. And uh, yeah, we will be answering your questions uh, after the, the webinar. And uh, thank you and have a good day.